scientist is not just you know uh, after the dinner just nothing to do. <laughs> we are looking into some fun <laughs> stuff, and not only yeah. the banana. Also look at the other <laughs> creatures that live it, but, but try to get inspiration for all these interesting observations. Welcome back. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And I'm Rosemary Barnes. And this is the Uptime Podcast, bringing you the latest in wind energy tech, news, and policy. Welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. On today's show, we've got a great friend of Uptime. Our guest today is Dr. Hui Hu, and he is an aerospace and mechanical engineer by trade, and he's the director of the Advanced Flow Diagnostics and Experimental Aerodynamics Laboratory and Aircraft Icing Physics and Anti-Slash-De-Icing Technology Lab at Iowa State University. So he's going to join us today to talk about his extensive research and icing and de-icing, uh, different types of ice, some of the uh, inspiration from nature they've gotten and some of these new coatings that are being developed. And it's a really fascinating conversation. Dr. Hui Hu is going to be with us in just a uh, few moments. And before that, we'll talk about uh, ExxonMobil. They've announced net zero emissions plans uh, by 2050. We'll talk about if that's really a relevant goal. They've taken a lot of flack for that. Uh, we'll talk about 3D printed magnets and some of the implications therein. We'll talk about cracks in a wind turbine uh, foundation that they found in a recent farm. We discussed this on a previous episode, but it looks like now they're going to have to replace all 50 foundations from that wind farm. And after the interview, we'll talk about Japan spending $43 million on studies regarding undersea cables, some new uses from Britain uh, on undersea cables, and whether turbine reefs uh, might be a really huge beneficial effect uh, really the likes of which we haven't seen before as far as underwater habitat growth uh, off, uh, offshore. So before we get going, I want to remind you, you can subscribe to Uptime Tech News, our weekly podcast update and newsletter in the show notes below, as well as Rosemary's excellent YouTube channel where she talks about everything renewable energy. All right, well, let's start with uh, Transalta's woes. So they own the uh, two sites in Kent Hills up in uh, New Brunswick, Canada, and it's uh, we've talked about this before, but the 50 wind turbines on the two sites in Kent Hills, it's confirmed now they're going to replace all of the foundations, which is going to cost the company between 75 and 100 million dollars, in addition to the 3.4 million uh, per month in revenue they expect to lose while the turbines are offline. Um, Rosemary, this seems like a nightmare. My question, I guess, to you is, what are they going to do with the turbine? Why they're replacing this foundation? Is it? They're going to completely deconstruct it. They're going to lay it down somewhere. What what might they do here? Well, I think that they have to take the blades off first and then I don't know if they have to fully fully disassemble it, but to be honest, I would assume that they, they do have to. I mean, a turbine isn't designed to just kind of like lie on its its back, even if it uh, you know looks like that. That might work. So I'm going to guess it's going to be kind of like a deconstruction, reconstruction um, type of activity, unfortunately. <laughs> No sleep mode. You can't like put those blinders next to it and just like gently go, nods off for a while. Um, Alan, this is obviously a huge problem. I mean, you'd think, I mean, Transalta has 20, uh, it looks like 20 different sites between the US and Canada. But I mean, you imagine something like this could have the potential to, to bankrupt a company. Oh, that's why they're insured, right? I think there's a lot of insurance companies that are going to bridge the gap here is, is because they can't make money. Uh, but at some point, the insurance companies are going to go after either the engineers or the construction company for the installation. Something there is off. And weirdly enough, it sounds like there's just large crown, large cracks in, in the foundations that propagated. And to me, that always says reinforcement bar or rebar. Something in the rebar wasn't quite right. And it, it only takes, you know, one minor uh variable to be thrown off here because the loads are so high. You got these massive wind turbines in these really windy conditions and it's hot and it's cold. Concrete doesn't necessarily like all those variables unless it's really over-designed. You, you, you could develop cracks and, and breakage over time. And at, at this point, I think I've seen this in other countries where they've shown crack foundations. I think everybody needs to go around and check the foundations right now to make sure everything's 
working like we think that it should. Well, do they though? Because if you find one of these issues, then you have to fix it. So, I mean, I think a lot of times people, <laughs> yeah. people don't go to the doctor because they don't want to know what could could be wrong with them. <laughs> um, yeah, it might be a little spooky to go check all your foundations with this news with TransAlta. I think in this case, it was a design problem, right? It wasn't that they made it incorrectly or they were surprised by the weather conditions. I, I believe that there was actually a design fault and that's why that's why they don't they, they know they have to change all of the um, foundations in this wind mm. farm and you can do a, it's like a paper a paper exercise to to check other turbines in the you know in the uh, province or in the the country you don't need to to go out and physically look for for cracks because you'll be able to check from the drawings whether <laughs> whether it was designed correctly or not <laughs> that makes sense so you're saying it's, it probably wasn't like an issue like the way it was poured or something like that like they can just go it the schematics and yeah yeah it doesn't sound like that that was the the problem so um big big problem for them and it will definitely affect whose insurance is paying for it because you know if it's a if it's a design problem i guess it's possible that it could be a a problem with the the standards or something but then it would be like a really really widespread problem so it sounds like someone just just incorrectly designed it and i I would assume their professional and indemnity insurance would be would be covering it and their premiums will be going up. Um, yeah. Well, and it sounds like bondholders. It's, so it says here, uh, bondholders of more than 50% of the outstanding principal have their right to immediately collect what's owed. And it sounds like that's a scary proposition for TransAlta. Uh, Alan, what does that mean? That's interesting. Uh, usually bondholders don't have that right. That's at least in these kind of projects, which is odd. So does that mean that they can get their money back out of the project? Sounds, if maybe. there's a default? Maybe, I don't know. Right, I guess it'd be a default, right? Yeah, that would be bad uh, if that's the case. One of the reasons you use bonds is because they're like this st stable platform and as an investment, it makes a lower percentage. It's not as, doesn't fluctuate as much as stocks do. Um, and they tend to be more around industrial projects like these or, or power projects, building projects, bridge projects tend to be bonds uh, because they just pay a steady rate. And if the bondholders can back out and say, we, there was something really off in this bridge wind turbine building and I want my money back, ouch, uh, <laughs> that can really squash a project quickly. And that you don't want that to start, right? Uh, and don't want to get put in everybody's heads like, yeah, I can back out of a project if things are not going the way that I want to. It's not good. Yeah, so we'll see uh, what happens. I'm sure this saga will continue on. Obviously, we were talking about it a couple months ago, and now here's the next sort of evolution of it, and we'll see how this continues to evolve over time. So moving on, um, teams from the Jean Lamour Institute in France uh, have developed the technology, uh, or at least are perfecting uh, some current technology to 3D print magnets. Um, Alan, this seems like mind blowing. Obviously, I mean, typically magnets are just what taken from the earth. Um, but here we're now getting, I mean, we've talked about so much about 3D printing, be it concrete or thermoplastic or metals. Now we're able to 3D print magnets. <laughs> yeah, it seems crazy, right? And we've all played around with magnets as kids, and they tend to be these very hard, brittle things that if you drop them, they crack. And they, and, and and so uh, to 3D print something like that seems almost impossible uh, because there's, there's still magic and magnetism, I think. It's one of those things we don't really understand all that well at times. And uh, in the United States, uh, and I think across the world, everybody's getting concerned that uh, uh, the the rare earth minerals that make up some of these really strong magnets, magnets are located mainly in China. And in order to uh, find alternatives for Chinese mined magnets, they're looking to these 3D printed pieces where they can basically form a magnet in any shape using either recycled material or new types of magnetic materials uh, to be more efficient. So you don't have to machine them or uh, form them like you would. You would just put them like you're going to build a concrete house. It'd be a very similar thing, right? You're just going to start printing these magnets of the exact shape and size, which is things we really haven't done much of. And in, 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 in the motor world, generator world, we just use the, you know, we make them in the, in the shape that we want to, but we haven't really super controlled it because you can't do a lot with those magnet materials. But 3D printing them is astounding. 
I think I think it's a really an interesting change. And Rosemary, can you see where this is going? Yeah, I love this one. This is, I mean, I love additive manufacturing. It's it, it is like magic, and um, yeah, and then then magnets. I mean, there's in a lot of magic tricks. The you know the secret is magnets. They are <laughs> they are basically modern day magic. Yes. But what I really love about it is that if you don't need the same magnetic field strength everywhere, you can you know put the the magnet where you need it and not where you don't. So you can can really um you know start to start to make the 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 component that you need rather than the one that you could manufacture Uh, and in that way it really reminds me of when I first got interested in composite materials it was kind of for the same like oh wow this changes everything now we don't need to you know just machine something out of a block of of steel we can say we need you know strength in this direction in this location and then we can we can make it and so yeah I think additive and and now you know like (laughs) Um, additive has done that to all sorts of components and now to add magnets to it, it really seems like it's going to help solve some of the problems that we have with the, um, yeah, rare earth uh, supply chain and, and any, any kinds of expensive components or, um, expensive materials can be used in a more targeted way. So I think, I think that's going to really help, help solve some of the problems that we're, we're anticipating in supply chains coming up in the next decade or two. And so last year on the docket, uh, before we get to our interview, uh, is ExxonMobil. So they've set a public, you know, net zero ambition by 2050, uh, which has been met with a lot of uh, sharp criticism that it's not very ambitious at all, I suppose. Um, Rosemary, what's the deal with ExxonMobil? Was this just sort of a PR play and not really uh, really moving the chains? Or it, what, what's what's going on with Exxon? I actually think it's a weird PR play because now they've got this huge philosophical inconsistency. If they are recognizing, on the one hand, you know, this announcement, well, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, you know, like actually there's some glimmer of hope in this terrible announcement because now they're finally accepting that climate change is real and something needs to be done about it. But if that's true, then why have they got plans to just expand and expand fossil fuels, which is incompatible with doing something about climate change? So I don't know if it was me, I think that they had the the better position, um, more logically defensible when they just said, no, climate change isn't real and we won't do anything about it. At least it was consistent. Now it's like, yeah, climate change is important and we're not going to do anything about it. It's it's really weird to me. Well, and I, I want to pick your brain about these different scopes of greenhouse gas emissions. So there's scope one and two and three. Um, and so from this article from ABC News, they're saying scope one refers to direct emissions coming from the company. Scope two emissions associated with the energy they produce or, or I'm sorry, they purchase or use to run operations. And then scope three is sort of like uh, end consumer. So maybe, you know, where consumers using their pumped gas uh, in their car. Um, can you explain a little deeper what, what the difference in scope one and scope two is? Yeah. So uh, um, this this isn't something that I've actually spent a lot of time digging into because it's kind of, um, it's very, uh, it, it's kind of complicated and it's more like of an accounting thing than an, an engineering thing because, I mean, you just defined the emissions pretty well, um, the different types of them. But obviously, uh, what is scope one emissions for one company, those same emissions are going to be, you know, scope two emissions for someone else. And so the big criticism with Exxon Mobil is they're not clearly the scope three emissions, which is emissions that occur when their product is, um, is burned. So using their product um, creates emissions. So that's going to be, so they're selling a lot of, um, a lot of fuel, a lot of fossil fuel. And somewhere down the line, say a power station is going to um, burn that. Then that is going to be scope one emissions for the, the power plant. And then anyone who buys electricity from that power plant, that's going to be their scope two emissions. So you can see that if everybody accounted for all of their scope one, two and three, you'd end up triple counting everything. Once the whole world is committed to net zero and is accounting for these three, then you triple count. So I guess on that technicality, um, what Exxon is saying is, is true that you know, it doesn't make any sense for everyone to be looking at all of them. But I think the reason why people are rolling their eyes at this announcement is because you're like, you're a fossil fuel company and you're planning to sell more and more. So you're not just in charge of your own scope one and two emissions. You're actively pushing those emissions onto your, your customers. Um, so it, it's pretty cynical to say scope three emissions don't matter for a fossil fuel manufacturer. You know, it might be okay for some if you're selling cakes or something, then maybe 
you've got a more defensible position that your scope three emissions aren't that relevant. Um, you know, you don't know if someone puts it in a <laughs> puts it in a fire or something and generates electricity from your cake or whatever. But ExxonMobil know what's happening to their <laughs> to their product. Do once people they burn sell it. cakes? Well, this sounds you terrible. Could. <laughs> you, you could. And how would is that my responsibility as a baker? I, I mean. I, yeah, that's it's one thing when it's a bakery, and another another thing when it's a, a fossil fuel company that yeah has one one use in mind for their product. Of all the post apocalyptic movies I've watched or read, and my most recent was The Road by Cormac McCarthy. No one has burned <laughs> any excess food. They're eating their own. They're eating their excess food. Um, oh, anyway, God, Alan, that was it, the bleakest how, movie. <laughs> they made oh they made that into a movie, didn't they? It yeah, was a bleak. Yeah, it was a as bleak, bleak as book. the book. <laughs> It's my boyfriend's favorite book. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't enthralled by the book personally, but we'll go there another time. Alan, how, how this math, this math, scope one, scope two, scope three, mm-hmm. you're shaking your head a little bit. I mean, what does this stuff mean to you? It's uh, it's just in a different accounting system to me. And uh, do we really have to worry what Exxon does? Because I think that as an engineer, what the answer is on our side is, we make the cost of energy cheaper than what Exxon can produce it for, and it doesn't matter anymore. And that's where we're headed. So everybody's worried about Exxon all the time in the United States because it's a U.S.-based company. There's a lot of fervor about it. But it, the answer is on the other side, right? It's the stuff that Rosemary's doing with all these wind turbine people, all the solar people are doing. They're making the impact. Exxon's on is most likely going to be on the wrong side of the equation. It's just a matter of time. All right, we're going to jump to our conversation with Dr. Hui Hu on wind turbine blade icing. All right, well, Dr. Hu, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're excited to chat with you today. Yeah, no problem. You're welcome. Obviously, we want to talk about your research at Iowa State. And we know since the Texas incident last year with uh, the wind turbine icing, you know, you've got a lot of calls. You've been really, really busy since then. Um, so we want to talk, obviously, about some of the stuff you've learned over the years in your Iowa lab. Uh, but first, I think some clarification on climate would be important because obviously Texas is here in the U.S. And there's wind turbines all over the U.S., including tons of them in the Midwest where you are. Um, so you can, can you kind of take us through why was it such a crisis in Texas and yet, why do the Dakotas and you know the Minnesotas and the huge cold belt in the in the Midwest? Why don't they have the same issues uh, that Texas had? I mean, what's what's the the situation with climate? The second question you mentioned that uh, why the Texas particularly in last year was hit by the stone. I have a problem, and in the Midwest like Iowa, we have cold winter every year, but we don't see that. Actually, that's because for the ice build up, there's different kind of ice. We all know that ice uh, build up lead have two key factors. One is cold temperature. Another is moisture uh, or water. Okay, we usually in in scientific uh, words we call the liquid water content in the airflow. Usually, in Iowa we are cold, but we are dry. But uh, in the uh, east coast. They usually not that cold, but lots of moisture, particularly in this time in Texas. They usually not cold, but last year it was hit by the cold stone. And also you have Gulf of Mexico nearby. There's lots of moisture came from there. As a result, you have temperature not as cold as Midwest, but lots of moisture that's caused a problem we usually for icing, for cold and dry. We get the rain ice, and for the not that cold, a lot of moisture, you get the glass ice. And we all know that glass ice is much more troublesome, can cause much more damage to the aerodynamic performance of the airfoil. For example, cross section of the wing turbine, therefore, you will lose all the lift or generate that cause a much less torque to drive the uh, turbine to rotate. If turbine cannot rotate, of course, there's no electricity was generated. So the big issue is the humidity in Texas, obviously, that makes that better climate for ice formation. Yeah, that's, uh, as I mentioned, you have two factors. These two things balanced together make some uh, very 
uh, nonlinear behavior, I will say that. Uh, not only cold, not only moisture, you really have these two work together. And in some condition, they can be quite bad. So you said nonlinear, you mean like just even small changes in humidity could have just really gigantic effects on how much ice builds up? That's true, because um, we all know that for the uh, from scientific point of view, water turned to the ice is from a high energy level to the low energy level. So as a result, you need to get that uh, we call the lighting heat uh, fusion release. How fast that uh, heat was released will determine what kind of ice you're going to build up. So that's really nonlinear term came in. So in some of the conditions, that can go very bad. For example, glass ice, we usually say, uh, there you not only have the, the heat usually is tremendous because of the high moisture in the air. However, temperature is not low enough. Therefore, the heat release cannot dissipate it fast. We will accumulate locally, make the water do not turn into the ice right away. Then air will blow the mixture of the water and the ice go to crazy into the region. That is what the nonlinear we have came, we call the uh, uh, water runback process, cause the geometry of the complicated ice buildup. Dr. Hu, there's, there's two main kinds of ice here, and I just want to get a little more description about them. So rime ice is something that we typically see on airplanes, which is looks like smaller ice crystals that seem to accumulate on the leading edge of a wing or on the front of the airplane. Pretty normal things. If you've flown a long time in cold climates, you see rime ice a good bit. The glaze ice is the one which is a little bit different because I mean, you don't see as much in aerospace, but it's it's it seems like the glaze ice was really important in Texas. And it's a, sort of a much thicker layer of ice, like something you may get on your automobile. Uh, when, like when we're in Massachusetts, when it's really cold out, you get these sort of well, the water tends to run back big and then freeze. Yeah. You get globs, right? These big blocks that tend to build up on your car. Uh, it sounded like Texas was more this thicker glaze ice. And how thick can the glaze ice be on a wintering blade? How thick can it get? Uh, what kind of ice you get going to get it really depend on the temperature and the humidity. As I, you mentioned that for aircraft, since they usually fly very high in the sky and their temperature very low, but usually moisture in the cloud in, in that high altitude also relatively low compared with on the ground. Therefore, when the water, the, the super cold droplets in the cloud impinge on the surface, they're going to, uh, the total amount is less when they're impinging into the leading edge, that's most of the sure. location they're going to impinge upon, turn to the mm -hmm. ice right away. When the droplets right. turn to ice, it will get a very small grain of the rime ice. However, as you mentioned that in Texas, usually temperature is not that cold compared with very above, uh, high above in the sky, but you have lots of moisture came from the Gulf of Mexico. Therefore, uh, there, the total water amount is much significantly higher and temperature is lower. Therefore, when water turn into the ice for the first bunch, and the heat release cannot be dissipated because temperature is not that cold. Therefore, the second bunch of the water impinging on the air for leading edge, they don't froze into the ice right away. Therefore, air will push them, move to the downstream. That's what we call the runback as a result. And the water film will carry the ice water mixture cover not only at the leading edge, but also run back to cover almost all the blade surface. And the second question you ask, how bad that uh, glass ice can be, be become? Actually, we happen to did a um, field study of a wind turbine which sit near the ocean, very similar as what Texas wind turbine uh, location is. You have an ocean not far away, but you have temperature not that cold. We found that after 24 hours of the storm, 
the 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 a uh, slow condition, the blade at the leading edge of the tip, the thickness can be as high as 0.3 meters. That's about 12 uh, inch one uh, one feet of one the, foot. Yeah, of the yeah. slow is significant. Rosemary, obviously, you worked on um, the ice mitigation team for LM Wind Power. Did you guys? I mean, was this issue of runback ice a pretty significant challenge? Well, it's interesting because it's um, all through the academic literature on de-icing. It's um, mentioned a lot, um, and so I made a point to to ask uh, every wind farm operator in cold climates about how much of a problem it, it was, um, because you can't. One of the issues with installing a de-icing system is that you can't heat the whole blade. If you um, that the amount of uh, heat energy that you need to melt the ice. If you put that over the entire blade surface, then it's it's absolutely prohibitive. That you, you know it's um, megawatts of, of energy that you need to de-ice a, a blade. So you have to target it, and um, the trailing edge area has a lot more surface area than the leading edge. So in most cases, people are leading um, are heating just the leading edge of the blade. So there's this big contrast between what the academic literature is saying is important. There's a lot of focus on runback ice versus what's happening in industry. And it was really interesting because without exception, every single wind farm operator that I talked to said runback ice is something that academics care about and it's um, never, no one had ever noticed a problem. But that said, I never, I never talked to anybody who saw um, 300 millimeter thick runback ice. If, um, <laughs> if they were experiencing that, then I can guarantee that they, they would have been very concerned about it. So yeah, and the, um, the, the wind farms that I was working with were in areas like um, in Quebec and New Brunswick, which are pretty, pretty moist um and then a lot in sweden those were the main areas i was working so a bit a bit different um weather conditions than um yeah than texas or, or somewhere like that uh, average depend on location for example in the in the midwest area that power reduction due to the ice may be about 10 percent of uh, up to 15 percent not as high as what Texas get about 50%. And in the, pap- in the paper we published based on the f- field measurements during that uh, stone period, we see the maximum of 80%. And that's correspond that um, uh, about uh, 0.3 meter thickness of ice build up. Of course, that's uh, particularly stone experienced by the turbine for 24 hours. And for others, maybe not as significant as that, but the power reduction from um, 10% to 30%, that's yearly, is the average based on what we know from the wind farmers. And when when we're talking about that power reduction, is it, because obviously, Alan, like these can stall out, right? And they'll just stop spinning if the air if the airfoil gets, you know, poor, too poorly shaped from glaze ice. But... I mean, if you said 80% power reduction, does that just mean it's been off, like completely not moving for a pretty long period of time? Or is it really speed, uh, you know, spinning 80% slower than normal or is some combination of the two? Yeah, that's uh, during the field we see, we also not only use a drone to fly near the tip of the um, wind turbine that's about uh, 50 meter long blade, take, take a picture. Also, we do... Uh, very lucky when farmer want to sh- agree share the operation data uh, uh, of the turbine. We measured uh, wind speed at the uh, tower. We also measured the rotation speed of the blade. We also get a power uh, uh, output from the generator. All these things indicate during that period, there are significant time that turbine just stop and rotation velocity equals zero. But sometimes they also, they do rotate. However, the output from the generator is not as high as without the ice. You, that's caused the both stop rotation. Also, even the rotation, they don't generate enough electricity, the power as they're supposed to be. So both these two combination make that particular turbine we study up to 80% of the energy reduction during that period. Uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. 
Uh, I'm actually really surprised to hear that um, any wind turbine is operating with um, 300 millimeter thick at the, the ice tip because that must be like hundreds and hundreds of kilos of, of ice. And I know that wind turbine blades are not designed to uh, are not designed with that load case in mind. So, uh, are there not ice detection systems on um, a lot of the the turbines that you're looking at, or or why why is it the case that they're still trying to operate with so much weight of ice there? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's why I say we really, we have tried to identify the collaborators and many of the wind farmers, they usually, the most common strategy is when they have the detection of ice is bigger than some amount based on vibration, they stop. But for this particular study, we really have very glad we have a wind farmer, they agree that during that period, no matter what happened, and still can produce the data for us. That's not the routine operation. It's just for the scientific study we do it there. We're really grateful that we they can collaborate um, for this uh, field of study. So before we move on to some of the coatings that you've worked with and um, some of the other physics, is there a way to prevent one type of ice versus the other, or is there anything to really be done um, with rime or glaze ice, or is it really just more like based on your climate, you're going to get one or the other, or you know, a higher proportion of one versus the other? For many of the wind farmers, when they really see that ice don't come in, they just turn down the turbine that may be uh, safer and also easier to take care of other than um, you, you de-icing costs lots of energy. In the meantime, also Rosemary mentioned that um, when the turbine have the ice built up, that's going to generate tremendous uh, of the fatigue loading to the blade that's easy to short the lifetime of the turbine. Or not only turbine blade, also within the gear system that can cause problems as well. So um, therefore what we do in recent years is try to figure out the way you want to get rid of the ice, but do not cost too much energy as current uh, systems do. So we do uh, find that um, one research object is related to the, some special coating. Uh, usually people call them hydrophobic coating or ice phobic coating. This two is a little bit different, even though they sometimes connect to each other. Hydro means water. So hydrophobic means water don't easy to stay there. Of course, l less water is less ice built up. Ice phobic means once you have ice built up on there and the bonding between the substrate and the ice is weak. Therefore, if you have some vibration or even sometimes the wind speed generate the, the flow airflow over the blades, they can generate a shear stress that can blow those ice away if the bonding between the ice and the substrate is low enough. Therefore, we do look at hydrophobic coating, also ice phobic coating, and combine them with a heater. Um, that means you really only need to use a heating area into a critical position. That's usually based on our uh, study we found that along the leading edge of the blade, and there we usually see a spot called a stagnation point. What that means is that there, the velocity of the air go to zero. Also, shear stress, and there also very small, close to zero. So when a water go into those regions, they don't move. And when the water don't move, temperature is cold, they turn into ice. So when that start to get the ice built up, then lacks water impinging in the labor hold while on the surface of the water or ice do not on the coating or blade surface anymore. That region became bigger and bigger. Therefore, for those regions, doesn't matter what coating you use, don't solve the problem. That's based on our extensive study show. However, in those area, if you can put a, a heater or other mechanical vibration or something make the that bonding to the surface is not strong, then they can easily shut off. That is health. 
So therefore, we do recently study we call the hybrid system at a very small area near the leading edge, not like a regular uh, current design cover significant amount on the leading edge. That's, for example, we based on what we know, they can cover about 20% of the coordinates. But we are talking about only 5% or less in those regions. And you put a uh, not significant of the heat uh, due to small area, also due to the coating because the bonding between the ice and the surface became much smaller. So by doing that, we do have a uh, did a comparison study. We found that compared with the regular design, we can save about 80% to 90% of energy to keep whole surface free of the ice. In most of the commercial systems that are operating, in fact, in, in all of them, you're heating more of the leading edge than than just that. You're trying to heat the whole leading edge surface because that's the, the that's where most of the ice builds up, and that's where most of the um, the aerodynamic effect is. You know, a clean leading edge is much more important for the aerodynamics than the um, than the rest of the airfoil. So it was. Yeah, I wouldn't say I was specifically worried worried about that because it was already taken taken care of. Um, I definitely was interested in passive coatings, anti, anti-ice coatings, uh, hydro, um, yeah, hydrophobic, ice phobic coatings. But the problem that we had and, um, me and other people at GE had done studies over, you know, over 10 years or so, keeping up to date with new advances in the materials. And, um, there were, there were a lot of people promising a, an ice phobic coating, uh, a lot less that actually performed in, um, icing tunnel tests. And by the time I left, um, LM, I'd seen zero that had actually done anything in, in the field. Um, and the problem was that, um, when you put a surface on a wind turbine blade, then it's, you know, it's rotating around through dust and moisture and bugs. And um, as soon as the surface got even slightly damaged, it wouldn't perform the way that it was supposed to. And in most cases, we actually saw when something that was ice phobic was slightly damaged in the field, which ha- happens, you know, immediately after installing it you'd actually see it attracted more ice than than a normal a normal surface. So um, by the time I finished up on anti-icing technology, um, I hadn't ever seen a, a surface a finish that was, you know, providing, provided like it was, um, you know, actually delivering on the ice phobic, um, on the ice phobic promises. But I was definitely always keeping an eye out for advances because Sometime it's gotta it's gotta happen that someone someone gets there with a, a um, yeah an anti anti icing coating. Well, and with the with the offshore wind that's happening in Europe in the United States and eventually in Australia, that uh, we've I, in the aerospace community we have played around with um, ice phobic hydrophobic coatings that have been a little more resilient and it does take uh, air, obviously airplanes are pampered devices, right? There's mechanics and people on them all the time, making sure they're clean and shiny and keeping all the dugs and the the, the bugs and the dirt off. Uh, but I think there's just been a, a, a gradual shift here in the last, I would say, two to three years. And I, I've seen some really interesting work done on coatings where they do rely upon a uh, sort of a micro surface to keep ice and water off, but they're, they've become much more durable. And the, sort of the second piece of this is that uh, the, the thought process is that we put them sort of further back, keep them away from the leading edge where the, you're right, Rosemary, where the, 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 bugs and the dirt and the rain and the birds hit the impact and will almost immediately destroy the coating, that the back end of this thing, uh, the, of a wind turbine blade or an airplane wing, you I think there is the possibility now, because of science really, and research like Dr. Who is doing, that we may be able to use some hydrophobic coatings and some isophobic coatings on the cleaner areas of the blade to reduce the amount of heat we need to de-ice or keep or anti-ice a, a wind turbine blade. And Dr. Who, is that where research is headed now? Is there some promising new ice phobic, hydrophobic coatings for wind turbines? Really, how you manufacture a coating and how, how long they can survive on the harsh environment particularly as I mentioned for wind turbine blade, lead the tip, we talk about uh, impinging speed about 50 to 80 meters per second. 
But you talk about aircraft leading edge, we, you talk about 100 to 300 meters per second. That's different, is different, uh, is uh, in a different range. So um, uh, here, actually in our lab, recent years, we funded by uh, Levy, we uh, work with some uh, material scientists, develop some coatings that can survive uh, for very high speed impinging. That's usually within uh, 200 meter per second to 300 meter per second, we try to put on the surface of the fan blade for the engines. Just talk to some uh, uh, friends, they uh, look at some insects in, in, in Alaska or in the Arctic region. And for some of the insects, they have some special protein that can, can generate, make the water do not froze. Otherwise, those insects cannot survive. Therefore, I do wow, remember wow. That, uh, that the Levy have, uh, they call the MURIs, a multi-university research initiative, the yearly total investment up to 10 million US dollars to study those uh, anti-frozen <laughs> proteins that may be next yeah. generation of the coding or something that yeah. we can incorporate yeah. Yeah. in the engineering design. So I want to say is pe scientist is not just, you know, uh, after the dinner, just nothing to do. <laughs> we are looking into some fun <laughs> stuff. And not only yeah. the banana, also look at the <laughs> other creatures that <laughs> live it. But, but try to get inspiration for all these interesting observations, get a new yeah. idea, new coding develop. That's actually is make uh, yeah. progress, at least based on right. my personal um, knowledge, uh, experience in the past 10 years, that's significant progress in making it there. Of course, still, there's no way you find the one coding that will solve all the problem. Well, moving forward, uh, we want to talk a little bit about offshore wind. Obviously, it's going to be a really rough environment, really cold, depending on where they are. Obviously, like coast of Maine, you know, New Hampshire, Vermont, very cold, obviously wet because they're out, out to sea. I mean, do you, Dr. Who, do you see this accelerating research into coatings and, um, and other heating systems? I mean, what do you predict will happen here as offshore starts to really boom. Obviously, it's been all over the world, so this is not new, but especially here in the U.S., do you see a boom in, in research um, and queries from other companies trying to figure out, hey, what can we do to keep our hands off these turbines and keep them running and keep them ice-free as best we can? I have a PhD student particularly address the problem uh, with offshore wind turbine icing. Several unique things I think we need to look into first is their liquid watch content is much, much higher, okay? Because the moisture on the ocean. Another, because the sea spray, the water droplets size is much, much bigger, okay? All these things will contribute more severe disaster glacial ice formation. So that's actually is make a situation for offshore much, be much bad compared with uh, uh, much worse compared with what happened for the onshore. Okay, that's what happened. Another also very important uh, perspective we look into is the uh, solidity in the in the water because you have salt water and the solidity for the icing perspective it will be changed the frozen point. Sure. And however, in the meantime, also they're quite bad for the blade of the turbine because turbine blade usually is polymer based. And when the salt is there, they're easy to get enrolled from the solidity there. So all these things while coupling together, make a surface that the that, that salt will make a surface not as smooth. You usually need to generate roughness. And roughness is bad for trapping water get the ice build up. All these things will make uh, icing for offshore quite different from what you see in the onshore. So I'm sure when that happened, then maybe uh, uh, that's uh, get more public attention, that's lead more research funding to do it. Right now I try it and I write a proposal to the DOE uh, last year. It seems right now they are busy to put a turbine up other than really to see how they're going to operate. I hope in the future, we will, our research will help to better protect on the uh, offshore turbine in the winter. 
Yeah, you guys are landlocked out there in Iowa. Maybe you could just drill, make your own salt <laughs> salt pond. <laughs> we in the term, in the winter now we do put a uh, um, salt into the uh, mm. spray and try to see uh, what what's the difference at there. Also, we um, make oh, a, a, change the lozo system, make a droplets size is more close to what you see in the ocean compared with in the air that's usually only about uh, yeah, yeah. 10 to 100 micron. Right now you talk about millimeter droplets. Have you tried um, coating the blades in, in socks? You know, like obviously uh, a lot of places in the winter, they salt the roads when it's going to go a little bit below zero so that, um, you know, you don't get any ice forming. It stays liquid because the melting point of salt water is a lot lower than um, fresh water. So do you think, because I know like obviously in Europe, they have lots of offshore wind farms in fairly cold places and they currently don't have any um, ice protection systems in place. And I, I haven't heard of any, you know, huge problems. It's not like, you know, areas like Sweden and and Quebec, the wind farm owners are crying, you know, like desperate for any kind of solution because they're seeing such big losses. We haven't seen that in the offshore wind farms in, um, you know, like Finland, for example, um, and uh, yeah, all around the, the North Sea. Do you think that it's because the salty blades, you, you wouldn't often get temperatures so low that ice would freeze even on a salty blade? Yeah, that's a good point. As I already mentioned that because due to the salt existence, the frozen point will be changed, but it really depends on how cold your weather is and how low that uh, that uh, frozen point can decrease too. If your environment temperature is below that, definitely you will get ice built up. Obviously, this has been a terrific talk on icing today. Where can people follow up with you on the web and your research over at Iowa State? In my email, you should see that uh, there's uh, uh, we have the lab webpage. There also have my email. If any people uh, have an interest, ask them to send me an email. Actually, I do get uh, from time to time get email from people. Oh, even last year when I published a paper on that on that uh, communication things, I get many email or sometimes phone calls to the phone to the office. I'll do the best I can do. Doctor Who, thank you so much. So we'll link we'll link to your uh, your email and your your research, and so people can find you in the show notes or description of this podcast. But thanks again for coming on the show. We really appreciate the conversation. It was terrific, and. Uh, Good luck with all your uh, future research. I'm sure you'll be well in demand. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Nice talk to you guys. Yeah. Bye. All right. So we want to thank again our guest, Dr. Hui Hu. Again, you can check out his research and follow with them in the description and the show notes below. So in our last uh, chunk of the podcast today, we're going to talk about undersea um, cables, and then we'll finish with the reefs. So first, uh, in Japan, uh, there's uh, allocating $43 million on a undersea cable feasibility study. Obviously, Japan has their own goals um, with getting uh, wind power stood up there. Alan, reading through some of this, uh, their feasibility studies now, what does it look like they're trying to do? It, obviously, land is, a, on, is a, at a huge premium in Japan. So it sounds like they're pretty committed that undersea cabling looks like maybe the best solution for them? Right. It, it bypasses having to do a lot of infrastructure on land. So essentially, they have a significant amount of wind energy towards the north. Uh, and they also use our strike tape product up there too on the wind turbines. But there's a lot of wind energy up, up towards the north and they need to get it back kind of mid-south is where a lot of the larger cities are, right? Like Tokyo. And you could either put transmission lines through already developed land or farmland for that matter, or you can just drop a cable, run it around the island and pop it up right at the cities where you want to deliver energy to. So I think the, well, the interesting piece about this is like we haven't thought about that before. At least I haven't thought about that before. I think that the high voltage DC systems are getting to be super efficient where you can drop a cable in and it'd be a lot less money and time to put a cable on the seafloor rather than trying to build a number of transmission towers all the way from the north to the south of Japan. That's what's interesting about it because I, I, Japan won't be the only one who's thinking about this. There are a number of other islands, take the UK, for example, or Ireland, uh, 
Australia, New Zealand, where this may make a lot of sense. It may be just cheaper because of the new technology in high voltage DC to drop a cable in the ocean instead of running transmission towers and, and lines on land. Rosemary, do you see you see how this is going to change the way we think about energy distribution and how we power nations? Yeah, definitely. And um, you're right that Australia, we've got one planned um, in the Bass Strait that connects Tasmania with man mainland Australia. There's a, a project that they're, I think they're still trying to <laughs> trying to figure out who's going to pay for it, but they want to run a couple of um, uh, big uh, cables to connect Tasmania's hydro, uh, huge hydro resources with the, the mainland. Um, and then, of course, there's the Sun Cable project in the north of Australia where they're planning to connect to um, provide a lot of electricity to Singapore. Um, huge cable recently uh, re recently started operation between Norway and the UK, and I know there's other ones um, that the UK is, is planning to, to connect around. And I think that it, it is going to become... I mean, I, I kind of, I really like the subsea cable technology. I like the idea of, you know, you, you can connect much bigger geographic areas and that makes the variability of renewables way less variable for any individual location. Um, and so, yeah, I think that this is going to be a big solution. One thing I think is interesting about Japan, they're committed to the um, the energy transition and, and, you know, they have been working towards that for a while, but they've got it tough compared to Australia, a country like Australia or, you know, um, the US where we've got heaps of wind and, and solar and lots of space. They don't really have much of that. They've got some good wind resources in places. But what you see with Japan is that they're trying everything. You know, they've got one project where they're getting ammonia from um, Saudi Arabia, I think, or somewhere uh, in that region. Um, they're going to co-fire that with coal power plants. There's uh, a hugely controversial project in Australia right now. There's um, a liquid hydrogen ship that has just arrived in, in port in Victoria, the world's first liquid hydrogen um, transport ship. And they're going to take hydrogen from Victoria and transport it 8,000 kilometres by ship to Japan. Um, that project's really controversial because they're making that um, hydrogen from brown coal and just letting the CO2 into the atmosphere. They're buying offsets and pretending that that makes it blue hydrogen, which in my opinion, it does not. But um, yeah, anyway, the, the, the interesting part of that project is the liquid hydrogen transport because that will be a world first. But Japan, you know, they're in a they're in a bit of a bind, and I, I think that they're doing a pretty good job of trying a, a lot of different things. And um, yeah, they try a lot of things, see what the you know parts of least resistance are, and that's a good a good strategy, I think, because they don't have any amazing options. Um, you, you know, it's hard for them. Well, and over in England, so in Blythe, there's a new um, direct current conversion facility set up to provide a landing point for a new cable that's going to bridge the gap between. Uh, England and Norway. Um, so, Alan, you said that most of these undersea cables are direct current, and you said the conversion technology is improving. Is that right? Yes. Oh, we definitely so. And so, obviously, you know, there's tons of uh, wind energy and renewable energy in general over in Europe, but it sounds like more and more countries are seeing this interconnectedness as essential um, so that one country can benefit from different resources and another. Is that kind of how you see this going, uh, Rosemary, where if wind is really um, high at night in one country, for example, um, but low in some other country, they can sort of benefit from each other sending one back and forth. Is that kind of how this maybe this big web of cables might work in the future? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, like between Norway and, um, and, and, and other countries, it's about getting the economics right. So Norway has hydro pretty much, you know, 24 seven if they want, but now that's become quite valuable to be able to generate electricity on demand. So they'll be buying electricity from the UK when it's, um, when there's heaps of, you know, wind or solar there. Um, it'd be really cheap. And then they'll sell it, um, sell electricity back to them when it's expensive and they've got hydro they can turn on it, you know, cost them the same to generate that even if the, the wind isn't blowing. But I think one big possibility that's kind of still a few years away is connecting, um, con making connections that will help with some of the seasonal variations. So, you know, imagine the UK has a really high uh, heating load in, in winter. If they want to replace their gas heating now with electricity, they're going to have a problem because you, you don't always have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of electricity in the winter. If they can connect to Africa um, with a subsea cable, then they would be able to get some really good solar 
resources at that time. So uh, I, I think that we might even, once the technology just needs to get a little bit better, I think, and Alan can talk more about where we're up to with that. Um, but I think that there is, <laughs> you know, a chance to solve even bigger problems than just, you know, intraday variability. No, I, I think there's a, a couple of challenges that are rapidly going to be uh, put aside. The The way that the UK is is handling the offshore wind uh, effort is they really can become, weirdly enough, the Saudi Arabia of wind in Europe, right? Right now, there's a lot of ships going from the Middle East with the oil and whatever else up to Europe. And then we also have the Russia pipeline that's pumping petroleum down to Germany and parts of other parts of Europe. Uh, what the UK is doing and other countries are doing, Norway is doing it too, is looking at what their natural resources are and saying, we have an overabundance of wind. We can take advantage of that and then we can sell that to Europe. And they're doing the same thing between France and, and the UK in terms of nuclear power too. So you, you see these countries become interconnected. It's like the United States and Canada. I don't know many people know that, but a lot of the energy in the Northeast actually comes from Canada. So we are connected that way, and we're connected for a reason. It provides stability. But in terms of e e economics, it could be a huge revenue-generating uh, source for the United Kingdom because they have so much wind and they have the technology to, to make the, the wind turbines on close to shore. They have all the, you know, they've been seafaring forever, right? So they have all the built-in pieces to be very successful in offshore wind. I think Norway's doing the same thing for hydro. So it's a very odd thing because, Rosemary, 10 years ago, we would never have thought that that would even happen. And yet here we, here we go. We're on the precipice of massive changes in the way Europe is connected. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of it, but I, I guess some people were thinking of it because the technology that we see rolled out now, I assume it's been in development that long. So lucky, lucky we've got some clever electrical engineers on, on the task. <laughs> yes. So last on the docket today, uh, there's an interesting article uh, by a ship captain who also does consulting for clean oceans and other such things, but wrote an interesting sort of counterpoint article to a lot of the what we hear from fishermen and fishermen groups, which is opposition to wind farms. Um, but this captain was basically saying that, hey, we know and we've known for a while that a lot of off basically these offshore uh, structures, whether from oil rigs or from wind farms, are building ecological reefs um, in their little lattice work, uh, you know, foundation jackets below so that we shouldn't, and we shouldn't necessarily jump to the conclusion that all wind farm, um, you know, construction is going to be bad for fish long-term. And in fact, if you, if you dig a little deeper, uh, you know, California's rigs to reef law was passed in 2010, although, uh, platforms have not been reefed with it. And that law basically said that, Hey, when we have these oil rigs decommissioned, we're going to look at them and uh, they can remove the upper 85 foot portion of the oil platform and then leave a lot of it in the or leave the rest of it in the ocean to basically not disturb the habitat that had grown there over all those years. Because oddly enough, after this initial opposition to, you know, offshore uh, uh, oil rigs, then people are like, wait, OK, it's been there for so long. There's so much uh, wildlife underneath it. There's mussels. There's all these fish. There's just like it's a whole little. Uh, reef of its own, don't pull these back up. Like we need to preserve these. So it's an interesting um, dynamic in this, uh, A, this rigs to reef law and just the way sediment changed, at least with oil rigs over time. Um, Rosemary, I mean, this seems like an obvious thing, but obviously you can't just leave every metal structure in the ocean and not every metal structure in the ocean is going to be a net positive for wildlife. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can leave every single one there. I, I don't, I don't know. I guess you'd have to take it case by case. But I have for a long time thought that it was weird the certain um, complaints that environmental groups are raising against offshore wind. Many of the the points, specific points they're raising, should have already been answered by other things that we're doing in the ocean. Uh, I mean, yeah, off offshore wind is not the first structures that we've built in the ocean, so. I'm interested to see what the experience has been with with some of those other other types of structures, and it does kind of seem like there would, in general, be a you know a playoff between what's good for fish and what's good for fish, fisheries, <laughs> um, and I, I don't know where the world is 
is not in a really sustainable place for you know for fish in in the world and so uh, I don't see it as such a such a bad thing as that you know we would put something in the ocean that made it easier for fish to get along and harder for big commercial um, fishing operations and it seems like the smaller fisher fisher vessels are not really being adversely affected because they're saying, you know, you you put in this structure and you get animals living in it and then the animals that live that eat those animals are, are attracted. And so Around it seems it, yeah. like yeah, other than like really huge um fishing vessels, everybody else is is winning. So yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to monitor how that goes. Yeah, in Massachusetts there's a really big concern about leaving the steel in the water. Uh, that the the fish the fishermen groups uh, near us think that that's going to be a problem because that still really doesn't go anywhere. We, we you know, the Titanic is still sitting at the bottom of the ocean. That was almost that was a hundred years well, ago. Well, they built that one really well, uh, Alan. <laughs> they did. It is they they really did. But steel does not rust underwater, right? And we all assume steel is rusting all the time, and it I guess it sort of does, but it doesn't really go away. And so if you're going to put thousands of pylons out in the ocean, I think the fishermen would prefer when you're done that you at least cut them down. Uh, you may leave the leave the bases at, at the bottom of the ocean and you'll yank them up. But I, I think there's a, a big concern about leaving them there because how long are they going to be there? And eventually, a lot of probability here, eventually somebody, some ship's going to run into these things and it's going to be a big problem. It's like the iceberg the Titanic didn't see, right? <laughs> It's the really well built one right hanging now. around and <laughs> the really well yeah, built exactly. one exactly yeah <laughs> yeah so I, I, I there is pushback about that and there may be uh, some legislation I wouldn't doubt there would be some legislation like what you put in the ground in the ocean you have to take back out when you're done and I'm sure that's the right answer but I, I there is some negotiations that are, are yet to be done. Yeah, well, you wonder if any, and I don't know the answer to this, if any of these have been designed in the same way, like, hey, we know this, let's build this new jacket to stay down there when it's done. So we'll make it with like a break point, you know, just like saw here when it's finished and the bottom, maybe they put some more <laughs> intricate designs or intricate metal work, like, you know, little hoops for the fish yeah. to jump through, whatever. And uh, yeah. just, to, I don't know, it seems like with, with all the recyclability we've talked about in you know, designing blades for end of life, why not design these jackets to stay down there forever? I mean, that seems like a no brainer, doesn't it? Rosemary, am I off there? That's why I imagine it, but I, I think they're too far offshore. Yeah. I mean, if they're close to shore, I think cool, but they're, they're talking about 20 miles offshore. And I think that's a little bit different. I think fishermen see that as being a little bit different because it's someplace that you would traverse. You may not be fishing there, but if you do create this natural habitat and there's a lot more fish in that area, fishermen are going to get access to that, but that the, the pylons won't let them have access to it. So there's just like this little catch-22. Well, they make sure that the, you know, the the depth that the boat goes is not going to hit it. Um, maybe if you, you know, they're going to put their nets down yeah. really deep, then they could get stuck on something. But um, I think what's being talked about right now, and I've only seen one side of this argument so far, so I'm, I'm not taking sides here, but I've only seen one side, which is the fisherman side. They're saying, you know, there's a there's a the pylon that goes in, there's a sleeve over top. They're saying that the top sleeve gets pulled off and everything down at the bottom stays. And they think that's a problem. You couldn't drag a net through there to catch fish. That's for sure. That'd be a big problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good for the fish. Uh, and they, they foresee it as... <laughs> <laughs> It'd be good for the fish. It may, it, may be, it may be good for the fish or may not be good for the fish. We don't know, right? Uh, but it's an argument. And I think until these things get flushed out a little bit, you're going to see a lot of pushback. And we're seeing a lot of pushback because when I log into YouTube, one of the first commercials that YouTube wants to throw at me is this little fisherman's ad about when turbines are bad for the environment. We got to get to some solution. And I'm not, I'm not sure leaving everything in the in the ocean floor is the right answer yet. Mm, but we've got decades to to figure that out. I, I think what we've got to do is, um, you know, watch we do. watch watch what happens, um, watch what the effect is. Try, you know, try it out, leaving a couple of stumps in there, and see how that goes. Uh, you don't have to do it mm. all at once. And yeah, it'll be thirty years or more before we've got like a significant amount of these things to remove. And I'll be surprised if they're not repowered at the end of that anyway. So, um, I think that there's Maybe. there's time to solve <laughs> to to deal with this gradually. 
All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Uptime. Again, be sure to check out the links in the description below where you'll find ways to contact our guest today, Dr. Hui Hu. We greatly appreciate his time. And again, they're doing great things over there at Iowa State uh, in their research facility. So definitely check, check them out and follow up with them if you have any questions about wind turbine icing. And again, we want to remind you, sh- sign up for Uptime Tech News, which you'll find in the show notes of this podcast below, along with Rosemary's YouTube channel. And be sure to share the show, subscribe wherever you listen on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And we'll see you here next week on Uptime. Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. This is why it just makes sense to install a WeatherGuard Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your technicians are going up tower. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.